from RPAG Chief Investment Officer Jeff Alvander about retirement plan investment options, RPAG's institutional approach, and the 95%. What's the 95%? What's the 95%? It's not a trick question. It's the, right? I'm, I'm the investment guy. It's the investment options in the plan, right? That's how important the investment options are, but more specifically, the investment options within a plan can represent up to 95% of the total plan cost. Just really show or, you know, why investment options are so important. But it's, it's not only cost, right, which is important when selecting an investment option. You can select any low cost Vanguard option and that, oh, did I just say that? You can select any low cost fund option and it's not necessarily the best one and it's gonna be the investment options that get the participants to retirement. Uh, so finding skillful managers and the best managers is extremely important. Uh, we wrote something a long time ago which uh, we probably need to uh, get back out there on the top of everybody's inbox. Uh, it's called the skill premium if you've been a member for a long time and it uh, looked at all of the funds that scored nine and 10 and the skill premium was basically all of the nine and 10 scoring funds or maybe included eights were all more expensive than all of the other funds, right? And in our system, the average active manager scores a six, they're average. Uh, it's hard to discern skill versus luck and uh, again, it just it pointed to the fact that, okay, hey, for some of these strong managers out there that are skillful, they cost more. But, right, that's like anything else, right? If you were to buy a TV, a car, whatever it is. So how do we get to the best managers? And that's relying on the RPAG scorecard, of course. And every good physician needs a, a good x-ray. And we uh, have historically said, hey, this, the scorecard is our x-ray to identify those great fund managers. Now I think maybe after, uh, after Vince's presentation yesterday, instead of calling it an x-ray, we're gonna call the scorecard a comprehensive metabolic blood panel. Uh, but that's what the scorecard helps us do. And now it's been in place for over 20 years. It's no longer a teenager. It, it, it's had its birthday. But that's given us a lot of time to look at it, to look at the results, to make tweaks, which we do annually in terms of updating benchmarks, metrics, style maps, whatever it is. And, uh, and we have some of those results. We used to publish a back study to showcase, share, hey, this, these are the results of the scorecard. This is how powerful it actually is. And a, a fun little story about 10 years ago, uh, when we did this 10, 12 years ago, we were doing these back studies on a consistent basis because we would do them every year. And that was when back testing uh, became a bad word uh, from the uh, regulatory bodies out there. So. At one point, we were told, FINRA, you know, there were some groups out there, they said, oh, you can't, can't publish this back study anymore. And we're like, well, what do you mean we can't publish, publish this anymore? They're like, no, you got it. It's, it it's, it's like back testing. It's like, no, it's real. We're actually showing actual results. And uh, they're like, well, you're only picking some funds. And it's like, well, we you know, score over 10,000 funds. Uh, so we're just sampling some funds. It's statistically significant. And they're like, no, you got to do it for all the funds. Uh, so you're unbiased, and it's like, all right, so if we do that, and then, and then they told us, well, and then you also, if you have something good to say about it, it has to be balanced, so you have to, have to say something bad about it too at the same time. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, and we're, just show, we're just sharing the facts here. So we ended up, we stopped, we stopped publishing the back studies at that point, and I'll share some of those metrics for you today in terms of what we look at, and, and they, they're reflective of really what some of the past back studies have shown us about the scorecard in terms of the value that it, uh, that it provides. Uh, one last thought on that, on that story, it was funny because 
the, my last argument to them was like, well, you allowed us to publish all these other back studies that are out there right now on, on the system and you know, for our advisors. And, uh, and FINRA said, yeah, well, you need to take all those down too. <laughs> we approved them years ago. So we'll, we'll get to that uh, in, in a little second, but it's a proven process. It's been around. We heard from our ERISA folks about the procedural, the prudent process, right? Uh, how did you get to fund A or B? And this is ties into our IPS. Uh, it's been vetted by countless compliance departments, uh, ERISA attorneys over the last 20 years. So a lot of history there. And uh, the, the one last bullet point here, which is an important one, which does help with the back study results, is the R, what I call the RBSA advantage. We love acronyms. So do you know what the RBSA advantage is? Does RBSA stand for? It's in the scorecard. And it stands for Returns-Based Style Analysis. And I have not seen any other scorecards out there that incorporate returns-based style analysis. I think we are the only group that does so. And uh, this criteria, returns-based style analysis, is probably the most predictive analytic out of all of the analytics you can look at. But nobody else incorporates it. And I think that's probably just because it's tough to incorporate this into a scorecard type of process. But we spent the time, the energy, uh, we've got the right partners, the tools, to incorporate that into the RPAG scorecard, which then translates into the results I'm gonna share with regards to some of the metrics that we look at when we do test the scorecard to see, hey, does it work? So what is the back study? The back study is uh, really, uh, we look, look at the last 10 years, we look at all of the scored funds over the score, scorecard period, uh, time period, and then we look at the next five years to see how all of those funds do, right? If we're picking funds that score nine or 10. And a lot of it is, okay, can we identify the skillful managers from the lucky? And so we're looking at just the active right now asset classes, and a lot of it's statistics. We use five years of history. Uh, but it is just statistics, and that's why we use five years. We want 60 data points, right? So you've heard me talk about right, the lucky coin flipper. You can flip heads 10 times in a row, but can you flip heads 100 times in a row? Or right, a broken clock is right twice a day. That's another one, right? What are we looking at? Well, we're looking at, hey, picking funds based on just performance metrics, top quartile versus picking funds that are nine or 10. Let's look at their hit rate. How do they do? over the next five years. Are they outperforming or not? We look at the level of excess return. Are they doing better from an excess return standpoint? That's skill. And then we also look at store, score stability, right? So if we're picking some funds, hey, is that range all over the place going forward or is it a tighter range? Have we done a better job at like controlling risk? Because that's one of the things that we say we do here when we're scoring funds in it, within this process. So this last, uh, this last year, uh, actually the last five years have been really interesting. So the one asset class wanted to look at specifically was large cap growth, right? You all have large cap growth strategies. And if, if you're following along and you're looking at all of these strategies and you're looking at the benchmark, the benchmarks outperformed like 90, 95% of all of the large cap growth managers out there been exceedingly tough to beat. Uh, and a lot of that uh, is because there's a select group, handful of companies that have done really well, right? Those FANG stocks, the Googles, Apples, that have propelled those uh, strategies higher, which these strategies haven't uh, been able to get more exposure to. So a lot of those folks are changing from diversified to non-diversified. You've heard that too in terms of the mutual fund, how they you know, how they categorize themselves. So we wanted to look at that to see, hey, how did the scorecard do five years ago when we were ranking large cap growth funds? And then over these last five years, how did those funds pan out? 
So I wanted to share that, but then I thought, well, let's look at a more normal asset class too uh, to share with you. So we took large cap value. I'm going to show you the large cap value results too. That was a more normal, if you will, asset class where the benchmark was about in the 50th percentile. And so the results were by and large uh, the same and similar, and we got some uh, good favorable statistics out of this back study to show us again yet that yes, the scorecard does work. The scorecard using that and leveraging that, the nines and tens, those funds do go on to outperform more than really the peer group, which is, I call it the, the high returning peer group, those in the, in the top quartile. And if you look at large cap value, had a better hit rate of 17%. Large cap growth was 100%. I put a little asterisk there, though, because uh, only three, uh, it, while there were three funds that outperformed, the highest return funds that outperform going forward from just selecting based on returns, the scorecard doubled it at a six, but that was at a 30. So again, a, a really unique environment, uh, but some positive results there. The excess return was better if you looked at higher scoring funds versus just the return metrics. Uh, and then the volatility was lower as well for both of those fund groups uh, on a go forward basis in terms of outperformance than just selecting from the high returning peers. So some good results here, just showing it uh, here, but this is something that we do and that we've been doing to see where we can make tweaks and whether or not the results Right, how the scorecard is working. And again, a lot of this is because of the RBSA advantage that we have over every other scorecard system out there, whether it's FI360, whether it's plan tools, they just don't have the capability to do that. We do, and that's probably the best, uh, you know, most forward-looking indicator that we have. So some great results there. And, and this is a conclusion, right? Some of it, it's not, not rocket science, we don't have a crystal ball up here, but you need to look at more than just performance. You can't just look at returns, right? Top quartile returns, top decile, uh, those funds are all over the board going forward. And the scorecard does that. And you know what I think is pretty neat is 50% of the scorecard isn't returns related at all. Uh, it's style and then it's those qualitative quality factors. And you're using this as your process, you're looking at more than just performance, and it's giving you better results over time. Now in the large cap growth category, I didn't put the average score there, actually over the last five years for those large cap growth funds that did score nines and tens when we chose them, the average score was a seven at the end of the period. So those fund managers came down, we did have some large cap growth funds that were on watch list. But again, the benchmark was outperforming about 90, 95% of the funds over the last five years. Uh, but that was versus an average score of six for those funds that just were the high returners that you picked. So uh, even though it was a challenging category, the scorecard still uh, yielded some valuable, uh, you know, valuable results. So that uh, is the back study. That, that was fun, and that's something that we do to refine the scorecard every year if uh, and when we're making changes. So look at 50% more, and back to the 95%, we get the most skillful managers. Well, all right, we've got, we found some of the most skillful managers. We have a proven process, a prudent process in place. How do we get to the lowest cost? Because I mentioned the skill premium. The most skillful managers and strategies are typically not the lowest cost. And so really that's leveraging all of our one trillion in assets that we have here to negotiate the best fee possible. And in most cases, it is the best fee possible in the industry. And on average, when you look at all of the CITs, exclusive CITs that we have, that savings is about 30%. That's a huge lever, right? if up to 95% of the plan cost is the investment option cost, this is a huge lever you can pull to bring down the total plan costs. 
So that's the 95%, but now that's in addition to everything else that comes with a CIT structure, which is the ERISA level oversight, which is more oversight or protection, fiduciary protection than just the 40 Act. And then of course there's the white label design benefits and advantages. And so that could be having conservative, moderate, aggressive in the glide path name. It could be just calling the option large cap growth, small cap value, right? Being descriptive because we all know as fiduciaries, it's not just the investment option part or the investment selection part. Uh, fiduciaries also need to educate their participants, and so that's another big fiduciary requirement. So it's selecting and monitoring the investments. It's also educating them. Uh, I don't know how many participants read fact sheets, but uh, for sure they're looking at the fund name when they're making their selections, if they're making selections. So some great advantages there in terms of leveraging uh, what we're doing in terms of the CIT space from a cost basis, but also with the best managers out there uh, utilizing the scorecard. So with that said, we just launched two new ones. These will be showing up on participation agreements uh, in the coming weeks. This will be our second mid-cap value offering. This is managed by Allspring. It scores a 10. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this. This is their flagship option, special opportunities. Uh, it's a great team, very, uh, the portfolio managers are accountants, very balance sheet focused, very unique, and that carries up to a 30% savings. Uh, so we're excited for that one. And then there is a small cap growth three option that uh, is managed by Voya. Voya picked up an, uh, an investment manager. Uh, we think they're pretty unique in what they do. Very tough space uh, in the small cap space, whether it's value or growth in terms of capacity. So we're adding a third one. Uh, this team, it scores a 10. This team is a little more conservative uh, with some quality bias growth, similar to the new mid-cap growth strategy that we just launched uh, earlier. So if you're looking for a, a growth, a more conservative growth option, this is a great one to consider, and this one carries a 28% savings. So uh, these are coming, and we will continue to look out for some of these best managers and negotiate a great great fee on your behalf. All right, so back to the best of both worlds. And uh, so thank you for indulging me for a little bit here. I think our industry is a little bifurcated uh, when you think about it. And you hear our partners and folks talk about the aggregator, the advisor versus the institutional consultant, right? And so my, my history on the investment management side worked a lot with the institutional consultants, a lot of that on the defined benefit space, even defined contribution. Uh, came over to RPAG doing a lot of work and talking to a lot of the investment managers. And you know, we have some groups that are institutional consultants Oh, but you know, this group handles you guys. You guys are you know, aggregators or advisors. It's like, it's, okay, well, we're all you know, trying to do the same thing for retirement plans uh, for participants. And, and it's fun. I thought I'd share with you. There's a survey, if you've seen it or not. Uh, our, one of our partners down the road does a survey, and they interview both groups. They interview a group of a aggregators and consultants to see what each one is focused on and, and to look at their numbers. And so I thought this would be fun to run through uh, with you folks because when I look at it, it's, uh, it, it provides some information and some insight. Uh, but is that, is that truly us? You know, which group do we belong into if we belong into a group? And so these were the top priorities for, uh, for the future, for the coming year. And they asked uh, the aggregators and, and consultants, well, where's the focus now going to be? And the first bullet point shares that. And the aggregators came back and said, greater personalization. And you heard us talk a lot about personalization. And we've been doing that, uh, of course, with multiple glide paths and uh, managed accounts. It was interesting. The institutional consultant said, retirement income. OK. Retirement income is important as well. And then they asked, what was the growth area? Where's the growth area at? 
And the aggregator advisor said, well, it's financial wellness. Advisor managed accounts. And of course, we're active there too. And you heard a little bit about managed accounts earlier. The institutional consultant said, well, it's, grow you know, it's the retirement income products. That's going to be a growing area. And we do agree with that. That is a growing area. And that's where we have our retirement income matrix, if you haven't seen that. We have been updating that on a much more frequent basis now as folks, as folks bring these solutions on board. So we are maintaining that, and that's something that you can look at and evaluate all of these products with. And then the last one was, okay, so what's, you know, what's the best delivery for retirement income? And the aggregator's answer was, well, AMA is the best delivery. And I would agree with that. And the institutional consultants were, well, the, the target date fund is the best delivery for retirement income. And well, I would agree with that too. And just as a little insight, that's something that we are looking at developing is getting retirement income into a target date fund approach. And so really when I look at all of this, it, it all makes sense I don't know as RPAG if we're in one bucket or the other because we really are doing all of this for you in terms of consulting. So that was fun to look at. The other thing that uh, the survey had were some numbers. Uh, first, that the, really that the institutional consultants were touting, which I thought was interesting. So I thought, well, okay, let's just run through again. Hopefully, you know, just indulge me a little more here. Let's look at some of these numbers of the institutional consultants. They were saying, wow, we have $1 trillion in white label assets, which is really just a fraction of, of the assets that they cover, right? Most of these folks have billion dollar uh, plans. Of course, our PAG advisors, we also have a lot of mega plans as well, but that was their number, about $1 trillion in, billion in white label assets. Uh, they said a lot of that, 80% around, is uh, focus on custom asset allocation services, so custom target date funds. So that's where a lot of their activity has been, and certainly you've heard a lot from us with regards to custom target date. And I thought the last statistic that was important was over 80% of them are recommending CITs when the savings is one to three basis points versus the mutual fund. So what was surprising with that number was it's not 100%, so I, I still don't get that. But reflective to what we are doing here, we have been right there with those folks. Uh, and right now, we're at 50 billion and growing. It is an important space to be in, the CIT space, especially white label. And again, going back to being descriptive. Custom asset allocation services, back to the personalization, and back to all of the advantages of finding the best managers, important. And right now, you've heard Nick, you've heard some of the numbers talk about the growth there. Uh, that's at a 30% growth uh, rate over the last three years. And then, should we be recommending CITs? What's the cost advantage? 100% of our CITs carry a savings over one to three basis points. Now I know there was one that was even with the mutual fund, large cap value, we did finally uh, just get fees on that to get lower than the mutual fund. So we're excited to say now that number moved from 99% to 100%. So, Again, thanks for indulging me. I think when you look at everything that we're doing from retirement income to the CITs, to AMAs, to personalization, we offer a lot collectively. And I think really now, there is no better time to be an RPAG member. I think everyone here is uniquely positioned to take advantage of everything that we're doing from an investment perspective. And so with that, 
I know my colleagues left everyone, a couple of them did anyway, with some thought-provoking quotes from Steve Jobs. So don't judge me. I'm going to leave, leave everyone with a thought-provoking <laughs> quote from Sammy Hagar from The Best of Both Worlds. And I think when he came up with this, he said this song was about the successes that Van Halen would have going forward, right? Because he just took over from David Lee Roth, if any of you are Van Halen fans and even know who David Lee Roth is. And then I think he also termed it as uh, also the, not only the future successes of Van Halen in this new version, but he also called it creating, uh, you know, creating his own luck or their own luck. And you know, I don't think it's creating your own luck. I think it's a little more than that and having the tools and everything uh, to create those successes. So we will have uh, Sammy take us out, uh, and the quote is just tune in to what this place has got to offer, because we may never be here again. So Sammy will take us out, but thank you, everyone. Thank you.